This episode contains spoilers for Game of Thrones and The Witcher series. Also, it's sponsored by Squarespace. The Game of Thrones series is set in a world that is filled with cunning and conniving characters whose every action is contemplated and calculated to get them one step closer to that highly coveted Iron Throne. And each of the contenders' fates is far more interconnected than they would like to believe. Every law that is implemented, every betrayal that occurs has a ripple effect throughout the continent, and no one is safe from having their entire life uprooted as a consequence of another's ambition. But this wasn't the only time the Iron Throne became became a prize to be won. One of the most influential events in the history of Westeros took place about 200 years before this and was called the Dance of the Dragons. It was a time of civil war within the ruling Targaryen family, who's best known for their copious amounts of inbreeding and supernatural ability to influence and control dragons. In the original Game of Thrones series, we were given a front row seat to witness what a single Targaryen accompanied by three dragons can accomplish, and it was nothing short of incredible. But in just a few short days, we're going to see this epic interfamily conflict brought to life right before our eyes with the premiere of HBO's House of the Dragon. And what excites me the most about that is there are said to be a whopping 22 dragons in the new series, each with their own unique personalities and relationships to their riders. But what if I told you that the dragons that author George R. R. Martin created for the Game of Thrones universe are a very modern take on these ancient beasts, and that the idea of a dragon bonding with anyone, much less being ridden wouldn't even have been considered a hundred years ago. Well, it's true, and with the massive role that dragons are about to play in this new story, I thought that for this episode of the Messed Up Origins podcast, we could take a look at their mythology and the different ways they've been portrayed across time and in different cultures. From being the symbol of evil incarnate in the Western world, to benevolent gods that bestow luck and happiness on the lives of humans in the East. What is going on, mere mortals? My name is John Solo, and you're watching the Messed Up Origins of House of the Dragons, Dragons. Yes, that is the best title I could come up with. Considering that the majority of our watchers and listeners reside in the West, let's start with a breakdown of the Western conception of dragons, because what they're believed to act like and their abilities has evolved considerably over the last few millennia. Starting with their name, the etymology of the word dragon has been debated and is still not fully agreed upon, but many experts believe it stems from the ancient Greek word dracon and Latin word draconin which both translate to huge serpent. Now these huge serpents were not always mythological monsters. These same words could be used to describe a snake you'd find in your garden. But regardless of what they were called, dragons in mythology were always portrayed in a specific way. They were also always on the side of evil. There are no surviving myths from any Western culture of that period where a dragon is either a good guy or simply a misunderstood victim of circumstance. Whenever they show up in a story, it's to fill the role of the final boss for a hero and to cause chaos. Think Ladon, the dragon that Heracles slayed in the Garden of Hesperides. Or an even better example would be Typhon, the father of all monsters, as he was known by the Greeks, who was said to have a hundred dragon heads sprouting from his shoulders. He was born solely as a last-ditch effort on the part of Gaia, the Earth Goddess, and Tartarus, the embodiment of Greco-Roman hell, to dethrone the almighty Zeus and take out the Olympians. From the perspective of the Greeks and Romans, it doesn't get much more evil than that, which makes their decision to give this monster dragons as appendages that much more telling. Another notable all-powerful dragon is found in the even older Mesopotamian mythology. Tiamat was the goddess of the sea and a symbol of primordial chaos. She sought revenge against a younger generation of gods after they murdered her tyrannical husband, and she fought them in the form of a sea dragon. Also similar to how Gaia had beef with her grandson Zeus and created Typhon as a way to avenge her son Cronus, Tiamat created 11 monsters to avenge her husband, and several of them were dragons. But as mighty and terrifying as these dragons are, you'll notice that none of them are complex characters. Even Tiamat's motivation of avenging her mate is a primal one. Satan himself appears as a great red dragon in the Book of Revelations, and I think that most people would consider him to be a pretty articulate fella. 
But interestingly enough, while he's in his dragon form, he's reduced to a one-dimensional titanic creature of evil and chaos. So as you can see, the original Western concept of dragons doesn't have that much in common with Game of Thrones' dragons. Sure, they're both scary flying reptiles, but I would argue that the ancient ones are more comparable to the old gods from the Game of Thrones universe. But as we move into the Middle Ages, dragons start to become slightly more complex. They were still symbolic of evil incarnate, but it was around this time that they start to become known for their selfishness and greed. Instead of only being featured in primordial myths about the creation of the world, they began to show up in adventure stories where they would invade kingdoms, demand sacrifices, hoard gold, and keep princesses prisoner. Arthurian knights like Lancelot and St. George would slay these fearsome beasts while avoiding the fountains of toxic venom they spat out, and in the process, they would save their kingdom and the damsel in distress. But did you notice that at this point, dragons still aren't breathing fire? Probably not. You probably just assumed that every dragon I mentioned so far could breathe fire because it's such a given in modern day portrayals of dragons. Daenerys in particular uses this ability to her advantage several times, though something tells me that acidic, corrosive venom would have gotten her points across just as efficiently. I'm not exactly sure what story was the first to associate dragons with fire or why it did so. I know their poison attacks came from their association with venomous serpents, but I think the fire may have resulted from myths and folklore portraying the these monsters as evil, and then Christian texts relating evil to Satan and Hellfire. You could argue that the first flagship story to contain a fire-breathing dragon was Beowulf, and that took place in a very pagan Scandinavia. But you've got to remember that Beowulf was passed on through oral storytelling for centuries before it was written down sometime between 975 and 1025 CE. And most pagan texts from that time had to reinforce the Christian worldview somehow if they didn't want to be censored or destroyed entirely. That's the only reason we still have the prose and poetic eddas. They were written like storybooks as opposed to religious texts, so the church didn't mind them. Though it is worth pointing out that every serpent and dragon mentioned in those two texts, like Nidhogg and Jormungandr, spit poison instead of fire. Anyway, the point of that tangent was, I just find it fascinating that nowadays we all think of dragons breathing fire as a given, when for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, that was never the case. Now, it might interest you to know that between the 1700s and 1900s, there was a huge decline in writings about dragons, likely due to the rigid Christian beliefs from that time that associated serpents with Satan. It wasn't until we approached the 1900s that children's authors started to bring them back, like in Kenneth Graham's The Reluctant Dragon in 1898, and Edith Nesbitt's The Book of Dragons in 1899. But there was one dragon in particular that would influence all dragons created after him. I'm of course talking about J.R.R. Tolkien's Smaug. J.R.R. Tolkien's Smaug. 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 The dragon from The Hobbit. To be clear, Tolkien's dragon was not a completely original creation. Smaug was heavily influenced by stories like Beowulf and the Volsunga Saga, which featured a character named Fafnir, whose obsession with hoarding and protecting his treasure led to him being cursed and transformed into a dragon. Dragon Fafnir was the first of the literary dragons to have a real sense of self likely because he was originally a self-aware humanoid before the transformation. And Tolkien applied this self-awareness to Smaug. Unlike dragons from ancient times and the Middle Ages, whose desires were limited to revenge, greed, and hunger, Smaug is actually intelligent enough to engage in a game of riddles with Bilbo and put together clues so that he can deduce where he comes from and which faction he sides with. Don't get me wrong, the vengefulness and greediness are definitely still there, but in my opinion, what makes Smaug different from dragons dragons and old stories is that he isn't inherently evil. He's really just in love with himself. He felt that he was entitled to respect and treasure, so being denied these damaged his fragile ego, causing him to commit evil acts. This same ego is also what ultimately led to his weakness being exposed. But anyone looking closely at Smaug's character can see that he doesn't actually have that much in common with the dragons in the Game of Thrones universe. They're both flying, fire-breathing reptiles, and the Targaryen dragons have their own personalities, but I would argue that the latter are very much animal-minded. They can't communicate linguistically and are motivated by primal desires, like food and freedom to play. There's 
There's no denying they're psychologically bonded with their rider and have their own unique way of communicating with them, but this relationship is a lot more comparable to a cowboy and his horse. That isn't to say that horses or dragons are dumb. In fact, Tyrion himself even says, dragons are intelligent, more intelligent than men, according to some maesters. They have affection for their friends and fury for their enemies. But they do lack a certain sophistication that I'm having trouble putting into words. I'll just say it this way. I don't think Drogon would be able to solve a riddle, nor do I think Smaug would allow someone to ride on his back. So how exactly did we get to this point? When was it that dragons changed from monsters into noble steeds? Well, let's just say there's a reason that women hold 70% of PR positions. There were two ladies, Anne McCaffrey and Ursula Le Guin, who contributed the most to rehabilitating the dragon's image and changing the way Westerners thought about them. Remember that children's story I mentioned earlier, Kenneth Graham's The Reluctant Dragon, written in 1898? Well, in that short story, which is oddly similar to the plot of the Iron Giant movie, by the way, a young lad discovers a dragon living outside of his village, and to his surprise, finds out it's actually pretty nice. It loves poetry and learning, and doesn't want to attack anyone. That was the first instance of a widely circulated story featuring a dragon that wasn't a murderous sheep-eating monster. Then, about 60 years later, in 1967, Anne McCaffrey expanded on the idea of benevolent dragons and human-dragon relationships with her Dragon Riders of Pern series, where the riders could form psychological bonds with their mounts and could communicate telepathically. To a certain degree, I think this is how the Targaryens are able to control their dragons, though I don't believe they're speaking with each other in literal words, but rather feelings and intentions. The idea of dragons communicating telepathically has continued to be used to this day though, with the most noteworthy example in my mind being the Golden Dragon in the Witcher series. Now in Ursula Le Guin's Earthsea series, which started in 1968, the dragons aren't quite as friendly. I'd say they're comparable to Smaug and that they're arrogant, terrifying, and powerful. But similar to McCaffrey's dragons, they can communicate with select individuals telepathically. And while they normally see themselves as superior to humans, they do have a code of honor and can be reasoned with if you're worthy of getting your message across. Le Guin and McCaffrey really shook up the game for how dragons could be utilized in fiction. And without their contributions, we might not have some of our favorite stories like Game of Thrones or How to Train Your Dragon or Dragon Tales. Yeah, you remember Dragon Tales? I didn't have cable growing up, so while all my friends were watching SpongeBob, I was stuck with Dragon Tales. Sidebar, do you think Quetzal's name comes from Quetzalcoatl, the Aztec god of the sun? It has to, right? Anyway, the Western conception of dragons obviously had a big impact over how George R.R. R. Martin used dragons in A Game of Thrones but he also took inspiration from Eastern mythology. And I'll tell you all about it after a word from our sponsor, Squarespace. For the two-ish people who don't know about Squarespace yet, they are the industry leaders in DIY website creation. They have an amazing selection of tools that gives creators of all kinds the ability to design beautiful websites regardless of their experience level. There is a massive library of beautiful award-winning templates you can choose from based on what kind of website you're looking to launch. And after you've got that set up, you can add galleries of artwork and playlists of music to really make your space unique. You can also embed videos, create VIP members only areas to sell access to. And one of my favorite things that Squarespace does is give you access to analytics that show you how much traffic you have, where it's coming from, what people are doing while they're on your site. You can even sell products on the sites you build with Squarespace, a feature we're hoping to utilize on messeduporigins.com someday soon. What may be the craziest feature of all though is that all of this design work can be done inside your web browser. There's no fancy software to install, nothing to download or patch, and there never will be. So if you want to join the thousands in our community who view Squarespace, go to squarespace.com slash John Solo to try them out completely free. And when your site is ready for launch, use code John Solo to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Similar to how the ancient Western societies portrayed dragons as all-powerful, godlike creatures, the Eastern societies like China, Japan, Vietnam, and Korea considered dragons to be gods as well. Only these gods were a lot nicer. Instead of taking out their vengeful wrath on anyone who dared to cross their path, dragons were benevolent and wise and would bless the people who prayed to them with good fortune, health, love, 
and safety. The dragon dances you see during Chinese New Year celebrations are a form of these prayers, with the participants trying to earn blessings from the dragon gods so their new year starts off right. The color of the dragons in these performances are significant as well. In Chinese culture, different colored dragons represent different ideas. Red dragons are for good fortune, blue and green dragons were associated with nature and good health, yellow dragons are thought of as superior and often connected with the ruling class, and finally, black and white dragons were the scariest, with many believing their omens of vengeance and death. Okay, so I guess they aren't all benevolent and endearing, but the point still stands that unlike Western dragons, Eastern dragons have never appeared in folklore as the big bad monster the hero had to slay. Any fear they induce is of the existential variety. People may be worried about themselves or their family's health, but it wasn't a literal, this giant serpent is going to melt me with its acid or burn me alive type of fear. In fact, it is extremely rare for Eastern dragons to breathe fire. There are some occasions where they do, but most of the time, the closest you're going to get is seeing the dragon breathe smoke. Funnily enough, dragons in the East are associated more with water than fire. But at this point, you might be wondering, if Eastern dragons are so different than dragons in the West, how exactly could George R. R. Martin have used both as inspiration? To answer that, we'll have to dive into the expanded Game of Thrones universe with Martin's book, Fire and Blood, which tells us more about the history of the Targaryen family and is also the basis for the upcoming House of the Dragon series. Because even though it may seem like every Targaryen is cursed to lose their mind and brutally murder thousands of innocent people under thinly veiled claims of enacting justice and order, they haven't all been this way. For example, one of Daenerys' most noteworthy ancestors, J. Harris Targaryen, was called the Consolator because of his well-known ability to settle disputes amicably and maintain peace. He was firm when he needed to be, but he wasn't the kind of ruler to threaten and bully his opposition into surrender or execute people over simple disagreements. In fact, there were many occasions where he chose to forgive his enemies when he finally had them at his mercy. This man had the money, he had the power, he had a dragon named Vermithor he could stick on whoever he wanted, but he still treated his opponents with more respect than they would ever show him. He knew that only a poor excuse for a king would commit violence against his own lords and leave his own kingdom burned, bloody, and strewn with corpses. His grace was a wiser man than that, which went a long way in unifying the seven kingdoms into one. You could ask anyone in Westeros, and regardless of their house, they would agree. J. Harris was the shit, but the Targaryens did have their fair share of crazies as well. The worst of them is said to be J. Harris's predecessor, Maegor the Cruel, whose reign began with bloodshed and ended with bloodshed. On numerous occasions, he used his dragon Beleriand to incinerate anyone who challenged his right to do whatever the hell he wanted, even if what he wanted was to marry and murder all of his relatives. In my opinion, these two very different ruling styles and the duality of the Targaryen family are reflective of the two very different ways that dragons are portrayed in Eastern and Western mythologies. They can either be a source of protection and comfort or cause incomprehensible fear and suffering. One thing is for certain, we're going to see a lot of both when House of the Dragon starts next week. Speaking of, how excited are you for House of the Dragon? Let me know in a comment. Personally, that god-awful last season of Game of Thrones has always made the idea of revisiting the universe seem depressing and painful to me, but I've gotta say, putting together this episode was such a great reminder of what I loved about the series. The brutality, the politics, the characters, the dialogue. I'll be honest with you, I'm actually planning on watching House of the Dragon now, where before, I really didn't give a shit. Such a silly mentality, eh? It's like swearing off all relationships because you had one crazy ex who burned your house down with her dragon. But on that note, big thanks to every single one of you mere mortals and solo fan members for checking out this episode of Messed Up Origins and for staying until this point. Could you not? I hope you found the experience entertaining, enlightening, and a little bit horrifying. You can stop whenever you want. If you want to see more content like this where I break down the folklore and myths found in pop culture, be sure to sacrifice those like and subscribe buttons to the algorithm gods. I've also got a free podcast where I post on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Two remastered Messed Up Origins classics along with that week's newest episode, like this one. And to those who'd like to stay updated on Messed Up Origins news, like what projects we're working on behind the scenes, or even just learn more about mythology and folklore, follow us on Twitter and Instagram at 
messed up origins. I'll see you all again next week with some more messed up myth- Bubba, we're at the end. You gotta stay with me. I'll see you all again next week with some more messed up mythology and folklore. Until then, my name is John Solo, and don't forget, John shot first. Thank you.